All right. So we got shiitakes on logs, king strafaria on wood chips, bluets on leaves, almond portobello on composted manure. Now we're going to talk about oyster mushrooms, which really, this is easy. And I can't believe it, but I've been on the road for two weeks and I just looked at my little box and I found some oyster mushroom spawn, mycelium. Do you know what that means? You get to take some home. Yay! You're going to make a little, everybody's going to make a little pet. All right. But I want you to, I want you to pass this around and I want you to smell it. Right, I'm going to break it up a little bit. Very, very fragrant. It's in saw, sawdust spawn. Yep. Pass it around. Take a hit. <laughs> oh, shit. We're in Indiana. <laughs> What's it smell like? Close your eyes. <laughs> Tell me what you think. Good? Bad? There's a new adjective. There's a new adjective you can write down. Shroomy. It smells shroomy. Do you know what one of my dog's name is? <laughs> shroomy. Damn shroomy. Black lab. Anybody own a black lab? <laughs> Poor shroomy. It's like they're always starving to death, you know? <coughs> Oyster mushrooms are black labs. <laughs> they are crazy. They're hungry. Um, they also have a very wide set of chemical keys. So let's go back to your original notes that says heat, carbon dioxide, and sweat. In that sweat, is that mushroom's ability to break things down. That's going to come in handy for medicinal and remediation later, but um, maitake mushroom, hen of the woods, one key. That's it. That's how particular or uh, picky they are for eating. You better know what your mushroom likes to eat. <coughs> Like uh, maitake strains, if it's cloned or isolated from a red oak, guess what it needs to grow on? Red oak. That's it. So before you buy your spawn, you, you should know which mushrooms are picky. And definitely uh, maitake, chicken of the woods, those two are really picky. And I think Olga actually, uh, she lists them now as experimental. <laughs> unless you don't, unless you know the wood type. One key, all right? Oyster mushrooms have a huge key set, so they can grow on <coughs> almost any, any type of hardwood, which means their enzymes are nonspecific, which also means they can break down stuff that they're not normally used to eating, like the duck egg, right? They run out of food, they get hungry, boom, hey, that's right there, I'm going to eat that. That could be uh, diesel fuel, like anything. So I like to think like an oyster mushroom for eating stuff, all right? Spent coffee grounds, cardboard cereal boxes, paper towel rolls, stuff like that. So now your homework assignment is to, everyone's going to get a little piece of that mushroom mycelium. You're going to take it home. I didn't bring baggies, so you have to roll it up in something. Maybe roll it up in your, in the program I gave you, <laughs> and take it home. Where's that bag? Is y'all done with it? Let me see that for a second. Every single particle in that bag can make a new colony. Think about that. That's crazy. How many particles are in this bag? 
If you can guess, you can have it. But I'm not going to count them. Let's see. Every little particle can become a new colony, right? That one little piece can make this, which means this can make how much? As much as you want. <laughs> right. All right, so if you drop me off on a deserted island, and I would dare you to, with that, I could grow a million pounds of oyster mushrooms in 12 weeks with that. So that's your homework assignment. I'm going to give you a little bit. You're going to take it home, and you're going to start expanding it on paper, cardboard, clothing, everything. Do any of you have any of this at home? Can you find any of this if you don't? Uh, what do you live in, a yurt? Remember all the waste. All right. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to start. I think everybody here can get, I need some for Kentucky too. But everybody's going to get a chunk about this big. That's pretty generous, isn't it? <laughs> all right. You're going to take this, put it in a little bit of paper, towels, wet, uh, or a little bit of coffee grounds. It's going to colonize, right? If it runs out of space, if it eats that, what's it going to do? Fruit. Do you want it to fruit that small? No. So you got to keep feeding it, all right? Then you just stage it up, you know? So add this to um, maybe a pint-sized jar of coffee grounds. Let it colonize then that can go to maybe a gallon. The gallon can go to a five gallon bucket. All right, you get it to this stage, boy, you're rolling. What's that? How do you know when to move it? When it turns all white, all right? Does certain spawn work better in other spawn, like a DRF cake as opposed to a gene? Does certain spawn work better for different yeah. Would it colonize faster, though, is what I'm asking? Um, oyster mushrooms will colonize coffee grounds pretty good. It's, it's a particle size, too. They love it. Yeah. But they're going to eat genes maybe just as fast. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so here's, here was my first um, oyster mushroom bucket. I got um, the EPA paid for my college, and I had to go work for them for a summer. <laughs> and I'm... I went back at 38 years old, so I knew a lot about mushrooms. I gave them a little brown bag lunch about to the EPA in Athens, Georgia. They were like, we throw away all our coffee grounds. They recycled everything else, right, at, that, at, that, uh, at the research labs, everything, except for the coffee grounds in the break room were going into the garbage. So we set up, this is the EPA bucket, and we dumped all the material in there, paper towel rolls. Uh, I kept spawn in the fridge. All right. So now you can write this down. This spawn, how do you store it? In the fridge. How long can it live in the fridge? A long time. For years. But you're going to use it before then. I, I, I honestly tell people that spawn lasts about a year. Um, I've had spawn last for three, four years. It just goes dormant, all right? But that also depends on the mushroom species. It depends on the strain. So this is warm blue oyster. That's what you're going to get, all right? It's a wide range strain, actually. That, that'll be good in the fridge for a long time. Your almond portobello strain is a tropical, right? That's not going to last in the fridge for a year. It's not going to last in the fridge for two weeks. You're going to kill it. So how do you store tropical spawn? <coughs> Take a wild guess. Room temperature. Just leave it there. Room temperature. It won't fruit. It'll just sit there. What about your shiitake cold strains? <laughs> oh, man. What temperature does it like to fruit? 35 to 50. What temperature is your refrigerator? 
what is your spawn going to do <laughs> if you store it cold? It's going to fruit in the fridge. So how do you store your shiitake cold spawn? Room temperature. That's it. It's weird. It took me a while to figure that out. It took me 25 years. You got it today in one shot. <laughs> All right, so you're going to sprinkle your mycelium in. You're going to leave your uh, spawn in the fridge. Just take a little bit out. So this one bag will do, oh my god, maybe, maybe two five-gallon buckets. It'll do a lot. So you're just going to take a little bit out, sprinkle it in. And you see this was, I sprinkled, this is grain spawn, but I just sprinkled it in. You can see it. And that was like maybe two days earlier. Look how, look how much it already spread. It's quick. It's like trying to colonize, trying to find each other. Paper towel rolls in there. Somebody threw an apple pie in there from McDonald's. Oh, it ate it too. For your first experiment, I want you to use maybe a clear jar so you can watch what's going on, so you can learn from this. The, this little culture that you're getting today is going to teach you some stuff. Um, that's, a, that's just a glass pickle jar. I guess you would call it, um, with a threaded top. Do you see all the uh, coffee filters there? Just dropped them in. So when they cool down, mushrooms do not like above 105. You'll kill the spawn. So when it cools off, it drains. You drop it in. You sprinkle a little spawn. Next day, drop uh, your coffee filter in, sprinkle a little bit. So you put this jar like in your, in your kitchen and just feed it. And then it turns all white. You've made that much more mycelium. You basically are making spawn at this point. Right? I'm in the spawn business. And I'm teaching you how to not buy it. Is that crazy? That's not a good business plan, is it? It is if I'm selling books. But that's what I wrote that book. I got other stuff to do. You should know how to do this. It's awesome. All right, so this was my first coffee jar, um, threaded top. It colonized, all right, so you want to keep it cracked just a little bit so it can breathe. And you can mist it if it dries out and the mushrooms pop out the top. All right, so this jar actually, um, threaded top, it colonized in the kitchen. And I had the lid and I screwed the lid on loosely, but it was still, I could carry it with the lid, so it was threaded on. And I went to the back room and I left it there, up on a, on a shelf, and I forgot. Forgot about it. Right? Three weeks later, I come into the room and there's a lid on the ground. I was like, is there a cat get in here or something? And I looked up on the shelf and that's the day I took that photo. Right? That mushroom pushed the lid off over the threading onto the ground to get out. That's 80 pounds per square inch is what they've estimated a mushroom can lift, right? You see how it's kind of squished looking? It just pushed it right off. That can come in handy, right? When do you need a mushroom to push something, right? Keep it in your car? Flat tire, yeah. Just jack your, no, no, no. <coughs> so, Look around at the waste that you have. That's low-hanging fruit for growing mushrooms really quickly, right? Really fast. Shredded paper. The question of inks earlier was a good, valid question. Um, newspapers are now in the U.S. are all soy-based inks, so that's good. So that's, that's fair game. So newspaper, shredded paper. I teach also with... Um, used or like old, dirty egg cartons. I like doing this with the kids. How many of you are thinking about opening a farm like to make money? How many of you want to lose money? Just checking. <laughs> it's like only four people said they want to make money. Um, but I teach this to kids too. So if you're starting a business, um, you're, we charge $15 for a tour. Do you know how many kids we get? Do you know how many schools? Homeschool kids we get? A lot. Right? And they're blown away by the process. So market yourself as that way. 
um, and also teach them how to recycle using mushrooms like this. You know, this is easy. This should be mandatory in school. Look at that. So we spawn it with pink oyster mushrooms. Pink oyster. Pink oyster mushrooms have one of the highest protein contents of any mushroom. It's almost uh, eight, 18 percent. It's actually pretty good. Shredded paper and like from the day of spawning to pinning. Remember, it's got to colonize. It runs out of space. It starts to uh, produce what's called primordia, which are baby mushrooms. Look at all those baby mushrooms all over the place. Even those, those are tiny. And here's the, here's the weird thing. Mushrooms are attracted to oxygen. There's oxygen all over that carton, right? It's surface area, so there's a lot of mushrooms forming. But the ones that come out first have priority. So think of it like a, like a hog. The first one comes out. What size is that one? Yeah, like a pecking order. Big, big fat piglet, right? What's the last piglet out called? The runt. Why? It doesn't get the nutrition that the others do. So that's what happens here. The mushrooms that initiate first, right? get all the nutrients, so look, look at that. That's the same carton two days later. <laughs> oh, man. So that's called overpinning. All right. I'm going to make you write that down. Sorry, because it's important. This makes or breaks uh, oyster mushroom production, overpinning. Too many mushrooms forming, not enough battery, not enough child support. How's that? <laughs> it's too much. Too many babies. Let's look at that cluster right there. One little cluster coming out. What do you notice about this cluster? Big ones? And look at this other little cluster of runts coming behind it. All right? They're going to lose. So, um, but there's way too many clusters on this thing, too. So, a couple days later, this is what it looks like. Look at that. From that to that. Let me explain that. So, just a few of the mushrooms, even in this group, only one or two may mature, and the others will all abort, or they'll just dry up. You see what's going on here? That's telling me a story. Shh, they're just shriveling up, and you'll see more of it right here. Right? Look at all that. Dead. They just kind of channel their energy to just a few, which is okay, but you wasted a lot of energy on this. So this was fruited in the open. All right, so how can we limit its access to oxygen? How can I limit your access to oxygen? Here's a plastic bag. Should we do a demo? <laughs> a volunteer? Be like the last time they invite me back. Try to put somebody in a plastic bag. What would you, you want to do it? You want to volunteer? I'll put him in a bag. What would you want me to do to that bag? Poke a hole. Where's your mouth going to go, right? Right to the hole. Mushrooms are the same thing. <coughs> so here's what I want you to do with this mycelium. Um, and we'll do it right before lunch to save time. You take a little bit of that mycelium. Maybe find some wet cardboard here at a conference. Are we going to find cardboard here? It's everywhere. So walk around. Maybe ask the desk. Find one box and we can all share it. Wet it, roll up your mushroom mycelium in it, and put it in a Ziploc bag. If you put it in a Ziploc bag, what do you do? Poke a hole. Or just keep it cracked just a little bit. Right? Just needs to breathe. And look, your cardboard, your little burrito that you made is going to look like that. I give it two weeks. Because I make these burritos like wherever I go. I'm going to make one too. 
right? I just call it like rolling up sushi. You have this cardboard burrito. Now what can you do with this? It's going to fruit, but if you take that and flatten it out, then you can mix it in with maybe two more pieces of cardboard, roll it up, now you have three a week later. Then you have five, then you, you know, it just keeps expanding. Rip it up, put it in coffee grounds. Now you have a five gallon bucket. Every five gallon bucket, in one week, it'll colonize. Every bucket can make 10 buckets, which means that at the end of week two, you can make how many? 10 buckets can make how many? A hundred. On week three, how many do you have? A thousand. On week four, how many do you have? You see what's going on? It's getting dangerous. <laughs> Need to buy a bigger house. I had, um, I had this young kid come up to me. I, I do Mother Earth Fairs all over the U.S. And this kid came up to me. <laughs> I was at my book signing. He's like, thanks a lot, man. <laughs> he goes, my dad was at your class last year. And he goes, I came home from college. He goes, and my whole bedroom, is, it's now a fruiting room. <laughs> he goes, there's buckets of mushrooms everywhere. I said, sorry. <laughs> yeah. This is cool. This is a lot of fun. So try it. All right. I had a, a mother come up, another book signing. Mother came up and she goes, she has this little burrito <coughs> from the children's class earlier that day. And she goes, did you, get, did you tell my son to put this under his pillow? <laughs> <laughs> like, like it was the mushroom tooth fairy or something. I, sometimes I don't even remember what I say to kids. You know, I'm like, I think so. And this little kid like peered out from behind her skirt, scared, you know, because he got me in trouble. And, and then she goes, did you tell him to name it? <laughs> And I said, yes, I did. And she goes, Whew. I thought he was making it up. <laughs> <coughs> that little boy turned around into a crowd said, I'm going to feed this to all the garbage in the world. I started crying right there. You know, that's cool. So teach that. You know, if you're going to grow mushrooms, that's why I love to teach is, is that, is it can recycle a lot of cool things. You know, the mushroom boxes, the jeans. But once you have a bucket, boy, those are, that's like superpowers. And you don't need a lab to do that. You know, I do lab work, tissue culture, but the thing that prides me the most is low tech, no tech, how to expand stuff almost perpetually. That's why I go to Haiti. That's why I go to Jamaica. There's people who need food, all right? Man, that bucket, you can do a lot with it. If you let that one bucket sit, what's it gonna do? Fruit. But do you want that? Maybe you should expand it first, like one more time. Maybe get 10 buckets. You don't need 10,000 buckets right away. I'm just guessing. All right, that one bucket might fruit, um, I would say about four pounds of mushrooms on average. Nice surface area, three to four. You got 10,000 buckets, how many mushrooms do you have a week? See, it's a lot. But you can fruit all those um, oyster uh, mushrooms off of coffee grounds, paper, or cardboard, but the pink one is uh, really aggressive, has the widest key set, you would call it. All right, so now I'm gonna tell you about how uh, rate of growth, this is important. All right, it colonizes. It could take a couple weeks to colonize, but then it stops. You stop feeding it, or um, the bucket's full, or the bag is full. If I just let this sit, you know, I, we broke it up a little bit. You notice that? But if I let that sit, it can breathe a little bit. If I just let that sit, it's going to turn solid white again. It's going to knit itself back together, and that bag right there will fruit in about two weeks. Two weeks quick. It's going to need a week to repair itself, 
and then a couple days to form babies. That's the warm blue. That's the one you're getting right there. Same strain, right? So when you stop feeding your bucket, it's going to turn solid white. It's going to cross wall, really thicken up and turn white. And then uh, if it was in a bag, there's little baby mushrooms coming out. That's baby blues. From this slide right there to this one, all right? What is the time frame? Does anybody want to guess? Three days. Anyone else? Four hours. Six hours. <laughs> oh, man. That's why I love my job. It's not a job. It's awesome. This is cool. Tomatoes don't do that. So you make a, a three days, and we're, we're going to cover um, commercial cultivation of oyster mushrooms after lunch, right after. But I'm telling you, from there to there is six hours. So tell me. What is it going to be like in six hours from there? It's going to be huge. Size of a silver dollar, size of an orange, it's going to be big. <coughs> what about all those babies? Are they all going to turn into adults? No. Yeah, you learn that now. Most of these, look at the big one. You see? From there, it looks like that one right there. You see the big one? Hog. That one and this one, here and here. And the others, these are kind of, they're going to slow down and they're going to shrink. Are those contained in, in plastic of some sort with a hole? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we'll cover um, the number of holes after lunch, like why. You can poke too many, right? But yeah, I think, I think golden oyster mushrooms are one of the best. Um, we've got time. We'll just keep cruising until noon. All right, so to scale this up, yeah, you can use spent coffee, but uh, most people are not going to grow oyster mushrooms commercially on waste. All right, so we're going to look at other things. We're going to look at agricultural waste, agricultural byproducts, cereal, straw, cotton waste. Corn, see, there's kudzu. Water hyacinth, is there water hyacinth here? Probably not. What about in Florida? Oh my God, it's everywhere. Yeah. So what I'm, what I'm telling you is that key set, oyster mushrooms can eat just about anything. And you might not <coughs> live in Indiana the rest of your life. You may move. You may be down further north. You may be further south. So it's a good, good idea to know that, hey, these mushrooms can grow on just about anything. So what do you have the most of here? Or where, where you live? What do you have? Agricultural waste. Wheat, Wheat straw. straw. That's good. Anything else? Corn cob bedding. Corn cob bedding. I just came from Colorado, all right, consulting a commercial farm. What do they have a lot of in Colorado? <laughs> right. A lot of hemp waste now. We, I just ordered one ton. Just like that. Got on the phone and there it is. You know how cheap it was? It was pretty cheap too. Mushrooms love, oyster mushrooms love hemp waste. So if you can find a, a producer there for just the stalks, the ground up part, that's awesome. So how much did it cost? I don't remember. Yeah. I can find out. What's that? Who's your plug? My plug? For your hemp waste. Um, I'll find out after lunch. I'll just text them and see what, who that was. They, they had um, 50 tons of it, <laughs> so we ordered one. But um, there's also an opportunity to grow on vegetable waste. Like what happens in your garden or on your farm, right? How many of you are farming now? Like that's your primary. You want to add mushrooms? Okay, that's a great idea. You might be able to find that some of your waste can be dried and used for, for this process. Um, it's good to keep things circular. Um, squash waste, tomato waste, bean waste, stuff like that. You can sun dry it. You, know, you can't use this stuff green, so you sun dry this in the fall, 
save it, and then you can use it all year round. The mildew? What you, we're going to treat it in a minute. Yeah, she's asking about mildews and things, yeah. Which is actually good because the mushrooms will sweat and kill the mildew. Right, just like that mold did. But that, that's what I like about traveling around so much is, uh, is, the, is the challenge of growing on different things. You know, I went down to Haiti. How many trees are in Haiti? <laughs> you can probably count them. There's no tree. Oh, there's a couple trees. They're all they're gone. They cut everything down for charcoal, right? So what are you going to grow mushrooms on in Haiti? Cardboard and paper and carb. Exactly. There's so much garbage around. That's what we were growing on, which is good. Um, I, I think that was like just an amazing experience to go there and be like, oh my God. We need food. We need to grow it fast. And what are we going to grow it on? We walk down the streets. With, I walk down the streets with these kids, and we cleaned up the village. And at the same time, we're growing mushrooms. It's, it was crazy, you know? Um, they looked at me like I was like, uh, like voodoo, you know? I, I said, do we heard, we heard there's this guy who can grow mushrooms on anything. These little kids, yeah, we, we taught them. I pulled out a magnesium fire starter and made sparks a fire out of nothing. I felt like David Copperfield, man. They were like, they looked at me like I was scared. They were scared of me. I was like, shh, shh, made fire. <laughs> All right. So this is a big one. All right, I just came from a consultation. I'm not going to tell you who I was consulting. It's a big place. They've been growing mushrooms for three years, and they fly me out to Colorado. I walk in, I'm looking at their mushrooms, big box, you know, straw, and all the mushrooms are really small coming out. <laughs> it didn't make sense. There's a huge mass of mycelium, and holes were poked fine. Everything was fine, but the mushrooms were only like this big, oyster mushrooms. I said, that can't be right. So I went out there and I looked at their media <coughs> and they're shredding their straw like they're supposed to, right? And I looked at the straw after they shredded it and it was coarse. It was really, um, it wasn't that dense. It wasn't, wasn't uh, fluffy at all. So I had picked up one of their columns, like one of their bags, and it weighed almost nothing because it was like just loose straw in there. So the mushrooms form networks, right? And they try to hold those particles together. But the distance between the straw was so high that the battery was loose. So the mushrooms were starving to death. It was, it was bizarre. So I, I went out there and I went, can I see your shredder for a second? And I went out there, this is my shredder, but I went out to their shredder and I said, can you open it up and check the blades on that shredder? And they unbolted it and the whole blade was polished, like smooth. And I was like, when was the last time you sharpened this? And he said, we've never sharpened it. $3,000 later, they sharpened that blade. Right? That was the running joke while I was out there. I said, I'll be happy to sharpen anything <laughs> for $3,000. They sharpened the blade. It got fluffy again. We packed it into the columns. Now the yield's going to go way up. One little thing like that changed their whole business. All right? They're trying to grow uh, 2,000 pounds a week, and they were only growing 200. Sharpen the blade. <laughs> See? That's how important it was. So particle size is important, all right? It can also be too fine. Who asked the question about sawdust in King's Traferia? Now, now it's making sense. It can be too fine. Sawdust spawn is one thing. Yeah, it'll fruit off of this, but mushrooms like to breathe. So the particle size is important. 
Um, that's right out of a bale. See the, the, the length? And that's shredded once. And it's wet. It's soaked. But you can see the difference. OK? So this is what they were trying to fruit on. And this is what we're making now. And their yield's going to go up four to five times higher. That's a big number. And that's a big mistake to make. So um, shredding the material is important, whether it's a corn cob, corn stalk, hemp waste. All right, I look at particle size being very important. Um, shredding involves a step. And it's a step I don't like. I, I prefer that I buy my material already ground up. <laughs> All right, because that's, that's a number. That's a, um, that's a labor number. It's also um, equipment. It's maintenance of that equipment. It's emissions of the equipment. If you're thinking about ethics, you know, you're thinking about all these things that you're a part of on your business. Um, if you can find shredded straw, great, do it. Because shredding the straw also makes it really dusty and contaminant rich around your environment. Um, so why not find stuff that's already ground up for you, <laughs> right? It may cost more, but who cares? You might find if you do the numbers, which is what we were doing in Colorado, um, if these kids had to shred straw twice, run it through twice, you know how much labor that is? That's a lot of time. But we were finding this hemp bedding like this. And I, have a, I, ha I do have a contact number for them, if anybody wants it. Anyone? Yeah. Bales like this. It's a little expensive. Um, that's my four bales of hemp. I got in trouble for that because we weren't allowed to have hemp in South Carolina. <laughs> Clemson came out and said, what is that? I'm like, marijuana. But I grow mushrooms on it, right? But look at the particle size. Isn't that nice? Beautiful. I didn't have to do anything. Turnkey. So now I'm thinking, well, what if it was twice the amount of money than the wheat straw was? But I didn't have to do anything. So my time is, like anyone, it's money. So this has actually worked out better. What's awesome is this hemp waste is higher in cellulose. So it fruited, I think I got double the yield off of hemp waste versus straw. Double. That's why I'm a huge uh, supporter of the hemp industry. Right? They can make their CBD. They can grow recreational, whatever. But I want that waste. We need that waste. Right? There should be hemp fields everywhere, yeah? All right, so how do you treat this material? Going back to your question with the mildew and stuff. So here we go. You take a carbon-rich, uh, cellulose-rich, dried plant material, and you're going to soak it in hot water for one to two hours. How many of you can make spaghetti? Four people can make spaghetti. <laughs> Should I just skip this part? How many people can heat up water without burning it? Ten people. This is, come on. <laughs> All you have to do is soak dried plant material in hot water for an hour, two hours. That's, and they take it out. You let it cool off. What temperature do you cool it off to? You remember that? Below 105. Below 105. Yeah, you can touch it. You're good. You mix your spawn in, and you bag it. That's it. This is really easy. Um, you could start with a bale of wheat straw if you want. Shred it up. Make sure you shred it. Don't get that loose, big, loose stuff into a, uh, it's just not going to work. It's going to fruit, but barely. How much is a bale of wheat straw here? Pfft, shit, I'm moving here. Yeah, let's say average five. All right. How much is the spawn? Depends. 20 bucks. $30 delivered, one bag. $30. Five pound bale, you're at 35 bucks. Now, I get these uh, food grade barrels for $20 a piece, cheap. 
They used to have like fruit juice or something in them. Uh, put them on center blocks. Put a um, turkey burner under there or a, a beer burner. Get the water up to, I go up to 180. All right, I'll fill these barrels up to like, well, about that much water. It takes me about two hours to get up to 180. And then I'll take my straw and just drop it in. I've got these winches. You don't have to do all this. All right. But look at my investment so far. Let's do the numbers. Two barrels, 40 bucks. Center box, I found. Turkey burner. You don't need the winch, but that was uh, maybe 200 bucks. Okay. So this whole setup. If I was to recreate this, it would probably cost, let's say, 400 bucks at the most. Those two barrels, if I dunk them twice a day, can grow 400 pounds of mushrooms a week. That's only cooking twice, like dunking them twice a day, five days a week. 400 pounds of oyster mushrooms a week times worst case. <laughs> Wholesale, five bucks. How much is that a week? It's a lot. So um, the metrics of mushroom farming is good, really good. Um, I'll show you some uh, spreadsheets after lunch. Yeah. Are, are, you, are you heating it to kill any organisms in there or start to break down? Yeah, that's pasteurization. So uh, that, that's a great um, second question is it's softening the material. Um, the hot water is... Um, you have softening and hydrating the straw so the mushrooms can eat it better. Um, they can also draw their moisture from it, right, because mush mushrooms are what, 92% 90, water. They need that moisture in it. So there, it's pasteurization is good because it's going to leave the microbes in there to hold down the fort until the mushroom mycelium can take it over. Does that make sense? All right, if we sterilize this, which is almost impossible to do with a barrel, but if you were to have a big pressure cooker and sterilize it, now if, if any outside air or activity gets it, it could contaminate like really fast. So pasteurization is important. Um, bring it up to 180, you dunk your straw and the water rushes in and now, you, now it'll come down to like 160, 165. Let it sit there for an hour or two, take it out and drain it. Uh, you're going to have to weigh it down because straw is full of air. That's why they call it straw. It's hollow. All right? It's going to push it down. All the air is going to come out. The water rushes inside the particles. That's my winch. I got that from uh, Harbor Freight. Anybody ever heard of that chain? If you <laughs> it's cheap stuff that doesn't last but the winches do. I've had the same winches for eight years, all right? Everything else I bought there just doesn't, it's not worth it. <laughs> it's cheap. But this one goes up and down. I've got two of them. This one's uh, up and down, and this one is left and right on a uh, engine hoist, a used engine hoist. Boy, that works really good over the barrels. It just, yeet, drop it down, and it just, bloop, bloop, down to the bottom, lift it up, sits right above the, the top of the barrel, drains back into the barrel. And as soon as it's done dripping, I just drop it, all right? Lay it out on a, a clean tarp like this. You can use uh, diluted bleach. You are going to have to use, um, delegate specifically like a tarp for this. You're gonna also delegate a rake just for this or a manure fork or something. You're not going to like say, well, that manure fork is going to be used in the garden <laughs> or in the barn. Hey, I need it today for the mushroom stuff. No. You want to keep this stuff clean. So these are your instruments. All right? So drain. There's the barrels. Comes out. I just dump it over here. Have a nice clean tarp. And I actually just fold the tarp over the top just to keep it protected. It also, when something is really hot and wet, it's going to steam. And that's your moisture leaving. And I don't want that. So another reason I cover it, I have a tarp, big tarp, half, 
cover half of it, I take this tarp and fold it over. It takes longer to cool down, but I don't care because I don't want the moisture leaving. All right? It may take twice as long, but who cares? You want to preserve the moisture of the media. Um, folding it over, as soon as it reaches touch, like what, 105 or below, take your one bag of spawn. One bag of spawn will do all this. It'll do one bag of spawn will do 200 pounds of wet substrate. That's a good number to write down for calculating. So one, one spawn, one bag of spawn will do one small bale of wheat straw, if that makes better sense. Remember, that's why I was asking how much one might be. So you're thinking five bucks for the bale, twenty dollars for the thirty dollars for the spawn, you see, and then all those mushrooms. Um, next to that metric, you can put one bale of straw can produce thirty to fifty pounds of mushrooms. Depends on your skill level. And if you shredded it, if you're paying attention. <laughs> 30 to 50, or 30 to, yeah, 30 to 50. Fruiting pound for the, through the lifetime. Three flushes, let's say, right? That's a big difference. And I guarantee you shredding is a part of it. If you don't shred that straw, you might grow 10 pounds or five pounds. But if you shred it, maybe supplement it, you might get 50, right? So my job is to teach you how to do the best you can to get that the highest you can get. That is actually a beet pulp, <coughs> beet pulp and um, cotton seed hulls. So I think part of the process is maybe going to a local feed store, you know, not like a tractor supply, I'm talking about a country feed store and asking them what kind of waste they have. Um, don't get the beet pulp that has molasses and all that stuff on it. That's more contamination prone, but um, see what's cheap and see what's available. You might do a bale of wheat straw and shred it, but hey, the beet pulp was already the right particle size. <laughs> it was. It was awesome. But I tried to grow on 100%. This is a trial. All right, I cooked the two separately. I made like 10 bags of oyster mushrooms just on beet pulp. All right, then I made 10 bags. 50-50, and then 75-25. You see what I'm just doing? Yeah. And then I did 100% cotton. The, the, the cotton was expensive, but I got really good fruiting off of the cotton. I got really good fruiting off of the 50-50 mix, but the 100% beet pulp all contaminated everything. Right? It needed something else. So you have to sometimes practice and play with the formulas, but um, so you might find that 5% or 10% of the beet pulp might really help the cotton. So my job in Colorado was let's not go with 100% hemp waste, let's go with 75% hemp, 10% rice hulls and maybe 5% alfalfa meal, you know, stuff like that. So you're putting together a, a formula, yeah. Well, you know, with <coughs> Mostly the cellulose, yeah. Um, protein contents you need to keep low. Uh, nitrogen content you want to keep low because it'll burn it up. Mushrooms create what? How many things? Heat during colonization. So if your nitrogen is really high, then it can kill itself because it'll cook it. All right. We'll get to that in a minute. I think it's coming up. All right, but yeah. Mostly cellulose, that's why hemp waste was so good, and cotton waste. For me, um, we're certified organic. I have two organic certifications for the two companies. And my best formula was cotton, cotton seed hulls. Fruited really good until I found the hemp waste. <coughs> All right? How much organic cotton is grown in the United States? 
can trad use cotton? <laughs> no. I called, I called the mill and they laughed me out of there. I said, do you have any non-GMO organic cotton? <laughs> They're like, man, this guy wants to know if we have any non... He was laughing. Nope. So I had to give up all the cotton waste, find something else. Um, rice hulls worked for me. If you need sources for anything, let me know. All right. Um, you can dump this also on a table that has a little PVC insert if you want to spawn it and then bag it. This is uh, poly tubing. And we buy this through uh, Uline on, what is it? Poly tubing on a roll. I think that might be what it's called. Um, and the diameter of these things are important. Going back to the heat, you got to be careful. You can't do a big column because it can't breathe in the middle. Right? So you have to pick a, a column size that makes sense. So maybe 12, uh, 10 to 12 inches works really good. Inflated, it comes flat. So it might say, it might say 12 inches flat. But when you fill it, it goes down to like 10 or 8. So make sure you understand the inflated diameter. All right. Um, but maybe start with a 10 or 12 inch inflated diameter. All right, this is on a roll. You can cut it. You tie a knot. And then you can make it as long as you want, like a salami. And you just fill it, tie it off again. You pack it really tight. All right. You want to get all that air out of there, remember? Spawn it, stuff it into a bag, and then now you watch. Now you can watch this uh, spawn run happening. Same thing, just like in the logs earlier, if this was the individual holes, right, these particles are spread out. There they are. And they're colonizing everything in between. They're trying to find each other. They're going to meet. They're going to recognize each other. They're going to fuse. And they're just going to keep taking over that area, right? They're genetically identical. What if this was a blue oyster culture and this was a pink oyster culture? <laughs> Let's say you just got crazy one day. You were drinking the almond mushroom moonshine and you mixed everything up. <laughs> what would happen? Any idea? They'd fight each other. They'd fight each other. Somebody would... Somebody's going to win and they, they, they hate each other. Um, they're going to try to kill each other. <laughs> it's awesome to watch. This is what I do on Friday nights. I don't have cable. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, they're not going to fuse. It's going to be marble. The yield, oh, it's just terrible. So uh, you, you have to keep it homogenous. Um, but there it is. Now it's radiating out. Symmetrical, all right? If it goes asymmetrical, if it starts going really well in one direction and it's not growing here, what do you think is happening? It's contaminated. Yeah, that's what I want you to know. We'll leave here is to, um, you're getting a read on this thing. Mushrooms grow symmetrically. If it's not, something's wrong. Something's wrong there. There's either bacteria or another mold. So you want to watch that. You want to just kind of look at it and, and see what it's doing. Now it starts to combine. Um, also a thickening of the mycelium, right? Could be a problem because it slows down and it starts to thicken. That happens when it's, it's supposed to happen when it's done colonizing. So that's another symptom of contamination is thickening. And I was in this guy's lab in Colorado, to, uh, lab culture. I'm looking at his Petri plates. And even so, I could see a thickening on the mycelium before it even reached the edge of the plate. And I looked really close, and I saw a lot of droplets on the plate. <laughs> so what does that mean? Sweating. sweating. It shouldn't be sweating. It should sweat when it's done colonizing because it's eating, but it was sweating prematurely. So I said, I know we can't see it. He didn't have a microscope. But I said, I think you need to run this through some antibiotics because this one's sick. <laughs> All right. So the mushrooms will tell you what's going on. So look at those columns. That's um, three weeks after colonization. Isn't that, that's awesome. All white. 
Um, this was a converted chicken farm, I guess the buildings, you know, there's really long ones. And they had um, laying chickens in there. This is a monastery. And they came to me, I was at an herb festival, and I've known these, um, I've known these monks a long time. Uh, they're in Charleston, South Carolina, Mepkin Abbey. If you look up Mepkin Abbey, it's the first mushroom growing monks in the world. I got that on my resume. But they're awesome. So I consulted them for two years, and now they, they used to have 50,000 egg-laying chickens. And boy, I mean, I showed, I mean, manure holding pond, you know? It was, it's gross, like commercial farming like that, at that scale. But they were very humane. Um, you know, they really, I guess they were praying for the chickens. <laughs> but they did everything as good as you could for egg-laying chickens, I guess, on that scale. But uh, PETA came in and did an undercover hit, hit on them and said that they, the monks were de-beaking the, the, the chickens, like de-beaking them. All the chickens, they were totally cared for. So they shut down the egg-laying operation overnight. And they came up to me and they said, Trad, uh, do you think we have a chance to grow mushrooms? And I said, absolutely. You have the structures here. So they cleaned out all the cages. Right? And then we started hanging columns down. This, that thing was like, man, like 100 yards long, you know? They had four of these structures. They started with the barrels, right? Heating up the water, straw, just a little bit of straw and cotton. They got cotton waste. They're not organic, although the mushrooms are organic. They can't be uh, certified organic, but they're getting all this cotton waste for almost for nothing. So, do you all see the holes now? All right, so this is going to be important. One, two, three, so about maybe every, what, six to eight inches. You do the holes immediately. As soon as you spawn the substrate, you poke holes. Because mushrooms, do you want me to poke, you'll put you in a bag and not poke a hole? Not going to last. All right. The farm in Colorado had been growing mushrooms for three years. And I'm in their colonization room. I'm looking at their bags. They have columns. And I feel it. And I'm like, it doesn't feel like there's any holes here. <laughs> How long has this column been? Oh, we only we poke holes and we take them to the fruiting room. <clears throat> it's not what you want. <laughs> it needs to breathe. So immediately, that was one of the big changes. It's like, shit, they, these things, you got to poke holes. <coughs> They have to colonize first. They'll die. Um, they're suffocating. So these, these were just brought in. That's three weeks old, and that's four weeks old. Look how quick. That's really fast. Yep. How many flushes do you get out of that? How many flushes do we get out of this? Um, it depends on the strain, the substrate, but I would say five to seven. But count on, you can get five. Now I'm going to go over some numbers. You may not want to do five. You may say, oh, that's great. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go for five. Here it comes. You're psychic. You knew the slide was coming. <laughs> <coughs> now we do some mushroom math before we eat. That is unshredded straw. Can you see it? That is shredded straw with cotton seed holes, smaller particles in there. Now do you understand? Now do you see the difference in the quality and the consistency coming out of here? There's big ones hogging a certain area. Maybe there was a little bit you know, finer in there. The little ones, it's just all over the place. Everything was done identical. All right? But I guarantee you this column weighs probably half as much as the, the shredded one. So there's more of a battery there. Uh, but look at the clusters coming out of the shredded one. They're consistently the same size. Does somebody growing 2,000 pounds a week, do you think they're interested in consistent size? Oh, yeah. All right. So now comes the fun part. All right. He's asking, how many flushes? I'm more interested in how many pounds. So let's take three of these columns. 
three that are identical, identical formula. Let's say that I've uh, fruited them out the best before. I know that that column will make 10 pounds of mushrooms on the first flush. All right? 10 pounds. On one column, I'm going to poke 10 holes. How much does each cluster weigh? One pound. One pound. That's good math. Math majors, I see. If I poke 20 holes, how much does each cluster weigh? Half a if I poke 30 holes. 30. You see? See what's happening? So now you can orchestrate the size. But overall, the yield is the same. If I poke one hole, how much does that cluster weigh? 10 pounds? If it colonizes, but what's going on? It can't breathe. <laughs> so there is, it's probably seven, five, whatever. It's not going to colonize. So here's the thing. Now how about 100 holes? What does each cluster weigh? Almost nothing. Can you sell little mushrooms like this? You know what happens? You remember the runts? You remember going back to the word I used? Overpinning. You just screwed up. Big time. Too many holes, too much child support, <laughs> can't feed them all, and only a couple come out, your yield goes way down. All right? The runts, they don't make it. So be careful about poking too many holes. That's the lesson. All right? Um, here's another number for you. Let's say if you're growing commercially, you better be weighing these out. And for every bag size, if it's consistent or column, you're going to pick all these mushrooms off. You're going to weigh them on the first flush. Then it's going to rest for two weeks. And you're not going to water for two weeks. You're going to let them go dry, just like your logs. All right? And then you're going to water the holes again. Then, boom, they're going to explode. So they'll fruit every three weeks, these mushrooms will, oysters. So if you pick 10 pounds on the first flush, you're keeping your good records. Then you pick five pounds on your second flush. Predict what the third flush will get. <laughs> Two and a half. It's actually very linear. So this is something you can really easily set up in a spreadsheet. I'll show you that after lunch, all right, in five minutes. Uh, we'll take a break. We'll come back, and I'll show you um, a spreadsheet that I made that's really easy to use because it's very predictable, all right? If something fruits consistently every three weeks and you're making X amount of these per week, that is linear and that's really good for production. But you got to do the math, you got to do the homework. But after you figure out how many pounds you get per flush, you know, with a new formula, you don't have to do that again. It's very consistent. Yeah? So, how do you water those, like at the hole? I, I just use a hose on, um, do you know the, the, the nozzles that have multiple settings? Yeah. Um, I, I actually use the uh, streamer, like a, a shoot, like a, it's a, it, you know, a beam of water, and I shoot it right into, well, my clicker stopped working, it's weird. It did? <laughs> there, you didn't see it, but there was a thing on here that said terminate, and I had to, I clicked it. I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> Let's see if it goes. See? I don't know. You don't click on things that say terminate and say, yeah, I accept that agreement. <laughs> what if I just hit it and everybody just vanished? I'm like, shit. Control, alt, delete, everybody comes back. Um, all right, here's another problem. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's what we're getting at. So I just, um, and so two, two to three weeks of colonization, you don't need humidity in there. You don't water them at all. You don't want to. And then you water the, shoot the water in, and as soon as those little holes get wet, they come flying out. All right? So here's another problem. 
Um, mushrooms are attracted to light. Remember that? They love it. So you have these holes on these bags, what, six to eight inches apart? And mushrooms, some strains get confused. This is a brown oyster. It's actually one of my favorite oyster mushrooms, the brown one, because they're really meaty and like really strong flavored. Uh, the stem is edible, which is rare. But it's, it's, it's activated by light before oxygen, so they get all these mushrooms all over the column. And they're not coming out of the holes. So there's a lot of energy being spent, you follow, mm -hmm. on these babies that aren't going to come out. So how many of you are parents? <laughs> don't, don't be so excited. <laughs> He's like, me too. So you have all these little babies, your children, trapped under the plastic <laughs> with their faces smeared up against, looking at you, and they're, you know what they're saying? Help! What do you do? Kill them. Kill, kill them. <laughs> do you still have kids? <laughs> um, poke a hole. Man, let them out. I can't, I can't watch it. I don't want to see my babies suffering in there. You know what? But that's the wrong thing to do. You poke, then you're... Poke, poke, they're everywhere, right? Too much child support. You've just ruined it again. Too many holes. Don't do it. You have to look at these babies suffer. That's the hard part about this class. You gotta watch this go down, <coughs> right? So how do you prevent this from happening? Black plastic. Black plastic. Yeah, so you don't have to see it go down. Right? You don't have to see those kids suffering. The truth is, they're not forming because of the black plastic. So black is better in this sense. And I look at this photo, this is not mine, but you see how many holes they have in those bags? Look how small the clusters are. Does that make sense now? So if you want to make those clusters bigger, less holes, that's it. I think that there's too many clusters, uh, too many holes here for this grower, right? And Honestly, this commercial grower that wants to make them fit, you know, if they're going to grow 2,000 pounds of oyster mushrooms a week and they want them to fit into a clamshell, do you think that's important? Yeah. Do they have the ability and the knowledge now to do it? Yep. Their new formula, I said, I don't know, just poke a hole every four inches at first. If they're too big, you know, go down to every three inches. Just, it's just like that. And as soon as they have that formula down, they're, they're good. Every cluster should be uniform. They'll fit perfectly in a container, clamshell, what have you. So right? Yep. Is the, bag, is the, the black plastic uh, beneficial in all cases or just for the, mush, just for the brown? All cases. Okay, yeah. So you use black all yeah, they, they don't, but the brown just overpins a lot. Okay. Uh, the pink one pins a lot. The warm blue does not. Um, it doesn't really need black plastic, but that's what we use. So, if you're using all black plastic, <laughs> how do you know what's going on inside there? Right? So, what you want to do, I, th I think it's in my book, I can't remember, but you, uh, if, do 99% of your bags dark and just do one bag clean, clear. So, you can watch what's going on in that group. So, if you make 10 bags, black bags, make one little tiny one, just a little one. You can watch it. If that one little bag turns all white, now you know to take that group to the fruiting room and you water the holes. You see? It'll tell you what's going on. What if that one little bag turns green? What's wrong with the 10 or 100 you made in that group? You better get them out. They're all contaminated. Take them out and I do like, what a, like, an, like an autopsy on them. Slice them open. Try to learn from it. Learn from that mistake. You know, you can see what happens. Right? Um, yeah, you can stuff them and stuff. This was uh, a project in Haiti I did on different types of waste. Peanut hulls worked really good. Peanut hulls fruited in 10 days. <laughs> that is awesome. 10 days. Food. You think they like that in Haiti? <laughs> oh, man. <coughs> 
Yeah, nursery pots, too much surface area though. See that, the top? It's just like a, it's just like 100 holes. So what we did, uh, we started using these uh, fruiting bins. See the holes spread out? Um, these are 27-gallon totes. It's a lot of biomass. Mushrooms produce heat. All right. These things, if it's too hot in the uh, colonization room for the first two weeks, they can cook. The middle will cook, and it'll be completely dead. That happened to us a lot. So uh, we only use these bins in the winter, like when the temperature drops. We let the temperature in the fruiting room drop a little bit um, to 60, 55, 60, and these are fine. But if the fruiting room is 80, they might cook. So now you know the rate of growth. What do you think, what do you want to guess now, from here to here is how much time? If the room was 75 degrees, so it's warm, if so. What's that? Yep, probably three days. That's crazy. These are actually overgrown, right? They're way too big. Look at them. They're just touching each other. They're curling up. So these are not sellable. I mean, they are, but they're only going to last for two to three days in, under refrigeration. That's not good either. So that's the other thing I did in Colorado is I noticed they were picking too late. So you want to pick them when they're still firm and they haven't opened up all the way. And that's something you just kind of have to learn on your own. It's hard to teach that. As um, soon as they start to slow down a little bit and the gills don't open up all the way, twist them off. All right? they'll, they'll last longer. They'll last up to two weeks. But if you wait one more day, they last two days. That's a, that's a uh, logistics problem especially if they're doing 2,000 pounds a week. You think the chefs are going to want that? Something that rots like in one day? Uh-uh. You can use buckets, holes pre-drilled. You can stack the buckets too. That's kind of cool. Like a little column, like up this high. And there's my, my pink ones coming out. Isn't that beautiful? And I've got plants in my fruiting room. Why would I put plants in there? CO2. CO2 offset. Yeah, I could just put some tropical plants in there. It looks good. I uh, captured some tadpoles, let them mature in there, and now I've got leopard tree frogs jumping around my fruiting room. What do you think they're eating? Fungus gnats. <laughs> I've got fat, big fat native frogs sitting in there just sleeping around and just eating fungus gnats. And whenever it rains, they just start singing. It's awesome. All right, let's stop there. It's lunchtime.